So I have something a little different I want to share with you today. Today I want to show off my personal collection of Groman knives made here in Nova Scotia. If you're interested, keep watching. For those of you who are not familiar with Groman knives, allow me to give you just a quick backstory on how they came to be made here in Nova Scotia. So in 1950, Czechoslovakian knife maker Rudolf Groman decided to take his family and leave the political unrest in his country and move to Canada. And he was invited to come to Nova Scotia by the Picto Cutlery Company, where he could pick up with his trade of choice, his expertise. Well, the Picto Cutlery Company did close a few years later and Mr. Groman went on to doing a few more things but he never lost his passion for knife making. So in 1961 he opened up the Groman Knife Company in Picto, Nova Scotia, where it still exists today. All right, so what I thought I would do is take you down to my stump top or my bench top here, share with you each of the knives that I own from Groman. Uh, they're not going to be reviews, but they're going to be my experiences and my stories behind each of them. All right, so as I mentioned, each of these knives are my personally owned knives. They're knives that either I bought myself or in one case, one knife only, were given to me as a gift. So uh, yeah, this one is the very first knife that I purchased for myself that I would consider the one that started me down the path of what we now know as bushcraft. Of course, it wasn't back then, it was just playing in the woods. And this is the Russell Number no. 1, the original Canadian belt knife and uh, designed by D.H. Russell in combination with Rudolf Groman and produced through the Groman Knife Company. And this is a classic style that has been copied over many, many times. At last count, they say there's somewhere between 15 and 20 different types of copies, something very close to this along the way. And for very good reason, as they do say, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. This was designed to to be a hunting knife, not a bushcraft knife, but a hunting knife. And, and the key features of it, of course, are the elliptical blade design and the offset handle. And that's what makes it different so that your knuckles clear when you're working down on an edge. You have that forward sweep for skinning. You have the drop point that allows you to get way up front. You can still grab onto the blade and do all the fine work you want. Uh, it does have a little bit of jumping on the back of the spine here, but it is just a very comfortable, albeit a bit small, at least in my hands, this, this knife. So let me give you a few stats about it. This was design came into production, or at least it came into existence in 1957. Although, as I mentioned, Groman Knives wasn't formed until 1961. It was uh, coming to, the design was created by D.H. Russell, well-known knife designer, and uh, Rudolf Groman, they worked on this together. It has a four inch blade. It stands, that blade stands one inch tall and this knife specifically comes in a 1 8 inch stock which is carbon steel. I'll talk more about the steel used in the knives in a few minutes time. The overall length of this knife is 8 and 1 half inches. The weight is 3.5 ounces which is 98 grams. I purchased this in 1973 so that gives you an idea how old this knife is and this has been in my possession since that time of course. They've changed a little bit over the years not the general shape and design now they have a lanyard hole now they're available in stainless steel they were not available in stainless steel when I purchased this way back then little did I know the difference between stainless steel and carbon steel this one obviously took a patina on very quickly uh, yeah this was my very first out doors knife. Now I, I've had other knives since then. I had a buck knife for quite a while and uh, I but I kept this one. Everything else is gone. So this is my very first knife. What can I say about it? It is probably a bit too small for most bushcraft tasks in that it's it's thin here and makes it a little hard to hold on to as far as feather sticking. But if you're not feather sticking, this will do just about everything else you want to do with it while you're out in the woods. 
but it excels at a game processing knife. Fish, game, small game, large game. This is what this knife was all about and still is. All right, I'll come back to the knife and the knife steel in a few moments time. One quick thing is the sheath. Again, this is still the original sheath that I've had since 1973. Simple pouch design, unique kind of a lanyard on top. Yeah, just simple, nothing, uh, how should I say? Extravagant about it, just functional and good looking, really. All right, so that was my first knife. Now let's go on to my second knife. All right, this is the second Groman knife that I purchased for myself, and I purchased this one in 1975. I was a young teenager. I was working at a store that's no longer in existence known as Simpson Sears. It's also the place where I met my future and current wife, Gina. And I was working in the sporting goods department, and they had a full line of Groman made in Nova Scotia knives, and and I was especially taken by this one, number four survival knife. So let me open this up. I've made some modifications, which I'll share with you in a moment, put the sheath aside. So you can see that there is a similarity with the number one, the uh, hunting knife, the original number one design, but there are also some differences. Right off the top, it's larger. So let me just go over the specifications for this knife and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So this knife has a five and one half inch blade. That blade stands one and three eighths inches talk. tall. It is a three sixteenths inch thick stock stainless steel. Again, I'll talk about the steels for these knives in a few moments time. The overall length of this knife is 10 and five sixteenths and it weighs 7.5 ounces. So the number four survival knife. As you can see, it is a saber grind, as was the original number one knife, also a saber grind. That's the, the uh, uh, grind of choice for this type of knife, and I still think it is one of the best grinds you can have. You doesn't take a very much of a stretch of the imagination to look at this and think it looks a little bit like a Nesmuk knife with that forward uh, hump on here to give some weight forward to it. It gives you a little bit more weight forward for swinging and chopping, although there, this is not a chopping knife by any means. But it also does allow for you to get a hold of the front edge to do some more fine work. Again, if you wanted to do some game processing with it, you could. Um, I found that not that I did a lot of uh, skinning games with this knife, but if you wanted to, you could use that hump also for scraping the inside of hides. I found that it was especially good as a batoning knife. And uh, I, again, bought this knife to add to my collection. And this was really the first, I would call it the true bushcraft knife. This is still small by today's standards of a lot of our just general bout knives, let alone our survival knives or bushcraft knives. But in its day, this was considered a really quite a big knife. Again, it's still just a little thin right through here as far as grip, at least in my big hands. But the rest of the grip is long enough and wide enough this way if maybe not wide enough this way, to give me plenty of grip on. And this will feather stick quite well. It will split and baton wood of any reasonable size anyway quite well. And yeah, it's still just a good knife. I have no problems carrying this to knife today and saying this is a bushcraft knife. Now, the sheath is, oh, by the way, just a quick doodad. This has no functionality at all. It was just a little lanyard I was playing around one day and put on the end of it to give it a little bit of a, an aesthetic extra, if you will. Let's just take a quick look at the sheath. So again, the original leather sheath, simple design. It has a stud and leaf type of closure with a hole through it, and it's functional. It'll keep the knife in the sheath. Now, the only issue I had with this type of a sheath is the fact that drawing the knife out the knife would start to cut through the leather right here. So you can see the modification I made to it. Basically, I took a little piece of bungee cord, a hole punch, punched some holes through that little leaf, bring it back into focus here. And now when the, you open it up, it just pulls itself back out of the way so that it is not going to, uh, the edge of the knife is not gonna cut through it. Yet when I want to close it over, it closes over and stays closed on the knife. Simple function, elegant looking knife, really it is. This is an elegant looking knife. Survival knife, yes. Of course, a survival knife is whatever the knife you have with you when you need it. But uh, 
as a survival knife only? No, I don't think so. I think this works today as a bushcraft knife. All right, the third knife I want to share with you, coincidentally enough, is called the number three boat knife. And it's a variation on the first one, the number one knife, the original design, with some slight changes. Now, I called it the number three boat knife because that was its original design, but it has also been used by the Canadian paratroopers and called a jump knife. And there's just only a slight variation I'll mention. It's also been called a yachtsman's knife because of also a slight variation. So what are those variations? Well, if it came with this sheath, just the simple drop pouch sheath, then this was called the boat knife. If it came with a fold over snap down flap, then that was the army sheath. And that is the one that was used by the paratroopers, of course, to keep the knife in when they jumped out of their planes and had been issued to the uh, Canadian Army paratroopers for over 30 years. The other variation is similar to this one, but it did come with a Marlin spike in a little uh, loop attachment on the side of the sheath, very much like what you would have with a ferrocerium rod today, but it was a Marlin spike for working with ropes and knots on yachts. All right, so that's the differences between the three of them. So if you hear any of those three names applied to this knife, it's essentially the same knife, different sheath, that's all. All right, so once again, take a look at this. It also shares a lot of similarities with the number one knife. Let me bring the number one back into the picture and you can see the, how similar they are in a lot of ways. It still, it again has that leaf shaped blade, although the drop point is not quite as uh, forward on it. It has a handle that is somewhat offset at an angle and above the uh, edge of the blade, very similar to the number one, just a little bit different. Uh, this one does have a lanyard, one of my little bit green lanyards that I like to put through them. Uh, again, just a, a great little knife and very much in the same size. So this one has a four inch blade, long blade, 15 16 of an inch tall, one eighth inch stock, stainless steel in this case, overall length of eight and one quarter inches, 3.7 ounces. So you can see very, very similar in just about every way to the number one, just with a little bit of differences. Now, one of the things they say about the, why the handle is different on this knife is because this handle, and you can see it's got that kind of a wedge shape, a little bit wider to the back than it is to the front, will uh, remain in your hand better when it is wet. Now, I, I had no issues with the other one coming out of my hand when it was wet, and I did do some game process. I'm not a big hunter, but even with wet or messy hands, uh, it I never had an issue with it because, uh, well, I don't know, it just, I never lost it out of my hands. And this is designed to improve upon that with that shape of the handle. Again, with some jimping on the front. Now, there's one more thing I want to point out about this knife, and this may have been the reason why it was given to me, but I was happy to have it anyway, is what'll happen at Groman Knives every so often for any number of reasons, they will produce seconds. I think every manufacturer has that happen. But what Groman will do is rather than throw the blade away is they will stamp it as a second and then put it on for sale at a reduced price. And how do you know if you have a second? Hopefully it'll focus in on this. So right there, hopefully that's showing up is a circle with an S in it. And that stamp indicates that this knife was a second. Now, functionally, there's nothing wrong with this knife. Quality wise, there's nothing wrong with this knife. What made this one a section a second should show up here. Two different color handle pieces. So whoever was assembling this knife reached into the batch of handles, put two pieces on, pressed the pins in, and then they realized that there were two different uh, color variations and they decided to stamp it as a second, which was great for me because I don't mind that at all. And the knife is every bit as functional as if it was a first class knife. Again, in stainless steel, I'll talk more about the steels in a second. All right, I have one more knife I want to share with you. This one is a bonus knife. I don't have a lot of information about this knife to tell you about. This is not something that's in current production by Groman, but back in the, the mid to late 70s, while I was working at Simpsons uh, in that sporting goods section, this knife was on display. So I decided to purchase it for myself. And it's just a small folding 
blade knife. It's a lock back. It does not lock in the open position. It does have quite a strong spring on it. It's a little bit like a sod buster design. It's just a nice small folding knife. Like the other knives, this one is made in stainless steel. Again, I'll talk about the steel in a moment. Like the other knives, rosewood handles. And all I can show with you on this knife, and hopefully it picks up on the camera, is the logo, the name Groman Knives. I have not been able to find anything else about it. So whether it was a limited run for whatever reason, I feel very fortunate to have it. I did carry this for a fair amount of time. You can probably see it's a little bit thinner in the blade from sharpening it. Again, we'll talk about the steel, but other than that, I have no information. If you know anything about this knife from Groman Knives, then I would really appreciate you place, putting that in the comment section below. All right, let's talk about the steels that Groman uses for its knives. So they started out with the carbon steel. And as I mentioned, this is the number one, the original number one that I purchased way back in the 70s as a teenager. And the carbon steel used then is still what's used today. And it is the C70 type European carbon steel hardened to 56 to 58 on the Rockwell scale. So that was the original knife blade steel in use then, still in use today. Then they followed up very soon after with their stainless steel. And the stainless steel they're using is 4110 stainless steel. And the composition makes it very comparable to the USA made 440 series stainless steel. Again, hardened to 56 to 58 on the Rockwell scale. Now, neither of these steels are known to be especially hard, heavy duty, or edge holding as many of the modern steels are today. So that may be considered a bit of a con and that's understandable. Most people today would like to have something in the higher carbon content either in the carbon steels or something else in the stainless steels. But you have to consider what these, uh, who these were designed to be used by. So carbon steel, yes, it does require more maintenance than stainless steel. It will rust, it will take on a patina. But as you can see, I've been able to maintain this over the years. And you know, I got a little bit of rust every now and then. It didn't take much to rub it out with some compound and bring it back to at least a nice, not I wouldn't call it a polish, but you know, a functional look with a any uh, pitting on it. Stainless steel, maybe you don't have to do quite as much maintenance on it, but all steels will rust. Stainless is just a bit of a misnomer. All steels will rust eventually. Stainless just happens to take a little less care to uh, keep it from rusting than does carbon steel. Okay, keep in mind who these knives were designed for. These were designed for the average person of the day who would buy this knife for hunting, maybe this knife for hunting, but certainly for use around the ocean, around salt water or lakes, because it's, again, it's the boat knife. They were designed with steels in mind that could take a good edge, an edge that may not last as long as more modern steels, but an edge that could be brought back to sharpness very easily in the field with minimum equipment and minimum skills. So that's what you have to keep in mind. There's a lot of the older style knives use steels that were a little softer, not quite as high carbon content as today's steels are, but ones that would be easy to sharpen. Some of today's super steels will last forever until they get dull. And if you let them go dull, then it really takes a lot of work to bring them back. And that's of course why I say, well, sharpen once, hone it thereafter, and then you'll never have to sharpen. In other words, keep it sharpened. Unless of course you chip the edge or roll it, and then you've got more work to do there. Uh, that's something else about these. I have not chipped or rolled the edges on either of these knives. I did a little bit. I did a chip and a roll on the bigger uh, survival knife from using it inappropriately is the best thing I can say. But it didn't take a whole lot of work to bring it back out. I, I found that I could bring the edge back very quickly. Now, one thing I've done to both of these knives, actually all of them, except maybe for the folding knife, is after I got it back to sharp, I put a convex secondary edge on it. And very easy to do and very easy to maintain. And now that edge will last just a little longer, be a little bit more durable because of it. All right, that's all I wanted to share with you is my collection of Roman knives made here in Nova Scotia. 
Their iconic piece of Nova Scotia history, we're very proud of them. They may not have all the steel and design of today's bushcraft knives, but they still serve in what their original function is for. And that's a hunting knife, and it's still a classic hunting knife. It would not be copied so often if that design did not work so well. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. I will, of course, provide links to the company where these knives are still sold as they were back in the day. Uh, this one, you won't see one quite like this, but one's very, very similar to it. They even sell kits if you want to buy the kit and put it together yourself as well. Okay, if you have any questions or comments on these knives, then please put them in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.